or have been suddenly in a car crash or something like that that need rescuing. And we do get involved in that. Um, but it's much more of a smaller part of what we do. A lot more of what we deal with is people that have got um, serious mental health conditions, um, dementia being one of them, um, suicidal bits and pieces, um, or you know, the, the getting lost doesn't happen so much, or runaway children, um, autistic children, that side of bits and pieces. Um, and each and every individual deserves um, to have a team of people like ourselves that will put back into the community and try and find them. So let's start talking about Suffolk Lowland Rescue Team, um, which is, is, is atypical for a uh, team and every team is slightly different, obviously, and has slightly different funding and all the rest of it. But all the Lowland Rescue Teams are completely self-funded. Uh, there is no input from government uh, in any way, shape or form. We're completely voluntary. Nobody gets paid. Um, we do various amounts of fundraising and looking at bits and bits and pieces to get funds in to uh, buy different bits of equipment. Um, just recently, we've bought five thermal images, uh, handheld thermal images, which will pick up a human at a thousand meters, which as you can imagine in lowland situation is quite useful, especially in Suffolk, which being possibly the flattest part of the world. Uh, you can scan the thermal imager when you get used to using it across a large open field. And if there's anything there, then you'll see it. So we're quite regularly picking up foxes, deers, rabbits, um, and thinking, is that something? Oh, no, uh, it's not. So we will look to um, fund ourselves absolutely entirely. The team itself will self-fund all their own kit, unless it's specialist kit, we try and get funding from that, but all boots, clothing, rucksacks, the lot is all self-funding. And yeah, there's a lot of credit to these people that spend a lot of money to go out and help people. So I was thinking about talking about search management training, but actually I think it's probably easier if I work out, if I tell you, so you've got an idea of what happens when you go, I want to join um, a Lowland rescue team. And then what we'll do is we'll go on to a few more assets and then we'll go, we'll describe how the anatomy of a search works. So what happens from the moment uh, and why we're called all the way through to actually getting on the ground and affecting the rescue. So what happens if someone joins, they um, come along to, in our case, they come along to a meet and greet and pretty much we explain what happens. Um, at that point, we will give the, the raw facts of what could happen, which is, Sadly, we might find someone that is not very well, shall we put it, um, all the way through to the elation of the returning a missing vulnerable person um, to their loved ones, which is a fantastic feeling. Um, so we explain the commitment. Um, the commitment side is that you can be contacted 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. In the nine years I've been in, I haven't been called on Christmas Day yet, but it's only a matter of time. Um, so. The, we, we describe all that and at that point we'll say, look, are you still interested? And a lot of people at that point, probably about 40% of the people go, oh, I didn't realise that you could come up against that. I thought it was just rambling around a wood and going, oh, look, there they are. So, no, you know, it's a lot more than that. Um, you, you may have to affect serious first aid um, in a very, very timely manner. We may be dangling you off a rope um, to get you down to a casualty. Um, and there is the possibility that we'll be working with helicopters and all the different bits and pieces. So if they come through that stage, they then go through an intake phase, which has changed slightly because of COVID, as you can imagine. Um, currently, what we're doing is doing a lot of online stuff, much like this, where we're talking them through the different bits and pieces, which is how a search is put together, what their role and responsibility is on a search, everything down to global terms. You would be surprised what you miss just walking forwards, although you're looking left, right, up, down, all that sort of thing. Every few paces, every few meters we ask, we train people to do a 360 degree turn because you're looking at things from a different angle. It gives you the opportunity to look behind trees. You see little alleyways that you might go, oh, I didn't realize that was there. So we move forward that way and we're talking to people. We then go out on training exercises, which we have got one coming up and we'll put them through their paces and go, right, this is what you think. What do you think here? What are you doing there? And we have put, put the team leaders with them and start to train them, teach them in the real world about what's happening. 
Now we use lots of volunteers. Uh, we use the Casualties Union as well. The Casualty Union, a fantastic organisation. Um, they came out of the Blitz, of, or developed from the Blitz in London during the war to train firefighters on how casualties would react. And we use them, they come to us and they do all their makeup and bits and pieces and they will act like a missing person. If we say, right, we want you to do this, they go, no problem, and they will act like it. it's fantastic. The best one I've seen recently was a um, amputee um, who is part of the Casualties Union um, and he's ex-military and he said, well, I've got an idea. Um, I'll say that I'm in this car crash and I've lost my leg. Okay. And he, when we found, the, found him, he'd actually dressed up his leg as though he'd just lost it. <laughs> we had to do first aid and all that sort of thing. So it's very, very real life, as, as real life as we could possibly imagine. Um, and ultimately, we have had people that will act like a dementia patient. Um, and, and we will train people to go, right, what's happened? And it's tr good training all the way through from the search management all the way through, because we don't know the answer to any scenario. We don't know the answer to an exercise. We, the longest exercise we've run was seven hours um, across the night. We've used a military training area, which we borrow off the military and say, right, we're going to come and play here. And the exercise started at late in the afternoon and ran right the way into the night um, to give some realism. Because more than likely, most of our searches, um, well, most of our searches, we get a phone call at about six o'clock in the evening um, because the police have then running out of resources um, and things have moved on. Um, or strangely, I don't know why, at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning seems to be the most one of the most common times that we get a call out. I don't know why. So once they've done their search tech training, they've been signed off and that goes through everything from health and safety to first aid to the different parts of search. Um, they will be in the team and they become an active member. They then can look to become a team leader where they will lead a search team and a search team is made up of four possibly five uh, search techs and a team leader uh, and they will be leading and controlling that team to go out into on a task that is set by the search management team they can diversify to add to that role um, certainly in our team where they can look at dogs um, so we have two main types of dog, which is the area scent dog, which basically you put into an area and will find anything human and come back and tell you. I did try and, some of you saw Harris earlier, I did try and train Harris as a search dog, but it, um, there was two issues that we had with Harris. One, um, he kept finding missing people and peeing on them, um, which was never helpful. Uh, so people generally stop training with you in that. The other side of him, bless him, a uh, lovely dog and I love him dearly, but he kept coming back to me and indicating that he found someone and then look at me blankly because he'd forgotten where they were. Um, so eventually we went, yeah, he, he's probably not, not going to make this one. Um, so now he just spends more time messing around with my children, um, which is great. I and mean, every now and then I do hide the children and he doesn't find them. So um the other sides of um, some of the bits we do we have a um, boat that we can put out on things like the river orwell or res reservoirs uh, we have a flood first response team which will assist the fire brigade and the um, police force um of uh, getting people out of their house we don't do the uh, the gucci um fast moving water where we dive in and swim and all that sort of thing we leave that to the uh, fire brigade to deal with that we're much more of the person the people that will come along and go right come on grab the cat it's about to flood here, off, off we go. Um, oh, there's a question, look. A dog with dementia. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly what it is. So, so they can diversify in various different things. We've started to use drones quite a lot, so they might be a drone pilot. We've got five drones now, all with thermal imaging, um, that will fly up and we can we train the, the pilots and the observers to be able to spot different heat sources. Um, and all of that has to be regulated by the CAA, the Civil Aviation Authority. After they've done team leader, diversified, they might look to come on and be in the search management team. Now, there's two main roles in the search management team, which is a search planner and search operations. Now, this gets where it starts to get interesting, um, because this is where you've got to decide and uh, take responsibility for where you send search teams. What's happened to this individual? Where has this individual gone? We have to think about it and go, what could possibly have happened? There is no point in something that we hate, we sort of call it, we hate doing, we call it salsa darts. Suffolk Lowland Rescue, the abbreviation is salsa, and we call it salsa darts, which we don't do. 
which would be where we get a map, and throw a dart at it and go, go search there, go search there. There's got to be method in our madness, if it will, uh, if you will, of them um, charging around in the woods. So let's look at Search Planner, first of all. Search Planner will take the place last seen or the place last known and take all the information about the missing person and then formulate a search plan. It will normally be that they would look at a route and a destination. So they would look up, up from where they were or where they were known, how, where are they going and how are they getting there? Now that could be as simple as they are going to the shop and they have taken this route or this route or this route, or they are going to this wooded area and they have taken this route, this route, and this route. Monday night, I planned a, uh, about five different routes for a dementia patient, a 74 year old dementia patient that was last seen at 21, 15 hours, um, who had been, we'd been told that was regressing in his addresses and had been looking at an address that he used to live at about 30 years ago, um, that was about 15 miles away from his current address. He was seen about one mile away um, from his address and we looked at routes to that address. Now, just so you're aware, that person luckily turned up at home at about two o'clock in the morning. We think that what happened is they suddenly remembered where they were meant to be going and not to this address and came back. But we may not ever know. So a search manager would also look at a set of lots of sets of st statistics. There's various ones out there. I finds this is this is the Grampian one. Kester, lost person behaviour. And what that is, is a collection of statistics um, of previous finds and searches. So they will be categorised into despondent, suicidal, dementia, all the different people. Uh, there's one in there for um, harvesters and berry pickers and when they've gone missing. And what they look at and they take the statistics of where they were found, how far away, over what time, in what type of terrain, and they look at it and they put it into various different charts. Now it's only a guide because every individual is different, but it gives us an idea. It might say 30% of this type of missing person is found in a structure, okay? But 70% are found on a footpath. So where are we going to look first? It gives us a clue, we're gonna look at footpaths. But if there is a structure next to a footpath, excuse me, then we would look at it from there. Herbert Protocol, yes, we do have the Herbert Protocol. It's on our website and I have used it and I have found a missing person from the Herbert Protocol information. Um, I have gone into um, a person's house and asked, have you got the Herbert Protocol? And went, oh yeah, we did that a few years ago. Give it to me, looked it through and it, we affected the rescue within an hour from the information of, from the Herbert Protocol. So it does work. Um, and I, I can't shout about the Herbert Protocol enough. It really, really is good. Dave, about... just in case people don't know about the Herbert Protocol, there might be a few that don't. Will you just give them a quick yeah, summary of absolutely. what it is? So the Herbert Protocol, um, although I can't remember who it was designed by um, off the top of my head, but basically what it does is in a moment um, with the family that or relations, um, you write down all the activities, um, the previous addresses, uh, likes, dislikes, um, mental health, sides of bits and pieces, capability, all the information about that individual, particularly old addresses, old schools, old habits, old workplaces, all of that sort of thing is really great information because we can formulate a search plan. If they have worked at a mill for 40 years, there is a high likelihood that they would think that they are going to work and re return to that mill. So we would then look possibly from the mill backwards to where that individual was. And it absolutely does work. And I, you know, I can't you know, say enough about it. I would say everybody, I'm almost thinking about doing a Herbert protocol myself just so that people can find me. It's absolutely a fantastic. Um, so I, I provide information on this. And, yeah, it's not a well-known thing. It, it really is. And the more anybody can shout about it, the better. They're downloadable from all over the place. I mean, we've got one on our website. Um, <clears throat> we'll go there. Tracking devices and apps. Yes, yeah, we have. We have I've never affected a rescue from what, one because we've never had one. Um, we do use mobile phone tracking. 
if possible, but it's, it's very difficult. We have, we're not an emergency service, well, we are an emergency service, but we're not got the authority to interrogate a phone. But what we can do is send a link to that phone. And if they so happen to click that link, it sends us a, onto our mapping systems, it sends us an exact location of that phone, which we have affected a rescue before of a, somebody, sadly, who was um, thinking about committing suicide and we went and got them um, because they'd got themselves lost in their, you know, the way they were thinking, they weren't thinking and they didn't work out where they were. Um, tracking devices, um, yeah, I've heard of them. I've not come across one that I've had to use yet. So I've lost my train of thought now, answering <laughs> lots of questions. I know, I, I, Dave, I'm going to say, let's, we'll shut the chat now. Let's shut it. Let's not have it. So you just do your talk and then and then we'll do all the Q&A. So anyone with a chat or a Q&A, hold it, write it in Hold it just for a second, because I'm too keen. I want to answer all your questions. <laughs> so the search planner, what happens then is while the search planner is putting this together, um, there's various different uh, digital mapping that you can use, that we use. There's also paper maps, of course. When I did my initial training, I used a felt tip pen and a compass to draw circles using measurements and highlighters and all of that sort of thing. So I know I can do it in the real world. Obviously, time to move on a little bit and there's various different digital mapping systems out there that we can use. So I mentioned search operations or search ops, as we called. At the same time as the search planner is putting all this together, the search ops guy is, or girl, is looking at what assets they have. Now remember, we're a volunteer service, so not everybody is available all the time. If we've got about 78 people that we can call on, and we will send out a circle, which I'll talk about in a bit, and we will get a response to who's coming. It could be 10 people. And each one of those people has got a different asset to themselves. They're a drone pilot, they've got a dog with them, they're, they're part of the water team, they're part of the bike team. Uh, the bike team's a fantastic asset. We can cover a lot of ground, certainly in an urban area, in a very, very short space of time. Mountain rescue don't, don't use bikes, although they're called mountain bikes. Going uphill on a mountain bike is not very, overly helpful, but we can get round a town very, very quickly and cover off on a hasty search. Very, very quickly we can move round. Um, so we, the search ops would be looking at that. They would then be formulating them into teams, looking, right, we've got a team leader, We've got these three people, we can put them together. As the planner is formulating all these tasks, the search ops team guy, girl, will take it and go, okay, I've got that asset, I can put to that task, there you go, off you go. Make sure that they're all working on their comms, so we've got radios that we're working all the time, and then the, the tasks keep coming from the search, man the search planner and the search ops will be deploying those tasks. Sometimes we will have a search manager that oversees both of those. Um, sometimes the search ops will take on the search manager role as well as, plan as ops and same with the planner. So there's a lot going on. Now, where does this happen? Well, we've got a, tran well, a it's not a transit van. We did have a transit van, but similar uh, van that we've fitted out the back with computers, printers, the radios. Um, luckily, we've just got a print, uh, sorry, a heater, you know, diesel heater, which is a fantastic thing because we were sat there last winter and it was minus 17 in the um, uh, van. I don't know how it was that cold. Um, and we looked at it and went, so we're volunteered to sit in a metal box that is colder than our fridge at home. <laughs> but ultimately, we've got a heater, which is a fantastic bit of kit now. Um, we also carry a defib there and we carry oxygen bottles for some of our team members, like myself, I'm a first responder as well. So I can go out and use all of those bits of kit if we get to the rescue. We use uh, grid references. Um, we try to avoid things like what three words, mainly because with what three words, you have to be able to spell. And if with a slight spelling issue, then you don't know where they are. It's, it's a lot easier with the grid reference because it will be something like TM and a string of eight numbers. Um, the police force quite often give us a um, uh, what three words for locations and bits like that. And the first thing we say, can you spell that? And they go, oh, and they have to spell it all out. So this is, this is the failing of um, what three words, but it is still a great system. So that's basically what's going on of all the different roles. So how does the anatomy of a search work? Well, as I said, the police force will get informed that there is a missing person. They will then categorize them into low, medium and high. We get deployed for high risk missing people, which 
although I'm not completely clear on their categorization, um, they, it is basically, if there is a risk to somebody's life, then would, they would be looking to call us. They haven't got the assets uh, that they used to. I know that in an area on a search that I went out to the other day, there was three police officers standing with me and they said, yes, we are the nearest police officers for over 50 miles. Um, and those three people, one, are not trained to the same level and two, should be policing. They don't need to be walking around the woods. There is a team. I had 27 people there, all fully qualified and trained to be able to deploy. And I said, don't worry, you go and police. I'll give you a shout if, you need, if we need you. And we got on with the job. So they, the police search advisor will generally call our emergency number. What that happens, and I'm hoping it doesn't go off during this call, otherwise I'll just show you on the screen and hopefully one of the other search managers will call it, but all answer it, sorry. Um, what happens is they call our emergency number, that rings on eight people's mobile, mobile phone at exactly the same time. When they answer it, it says, this is the emergency line, press one to take a call. Hit one, you're instantly talking to the police. The police have called us and said, right, we've got a problem. We will then take down all the details that we need, which will be name, age, description, what's happened, where they were last seen. You can imagine it sort of goes on and on and on of all the information that we need. We'll then send out a circle. Now, circle is a great system that we um, use. I log onto a website, I type in a load of details, I hit send, it goes to all the operational members within the team. At that point, they can reply with SAR A. SAR L or SAR N. SAR A means they're available. SAR L means they're available, but not quite yet. So it might be a lot of the time they might go, no, I'm available after work at five o'clock. Or SAR N, I'm not available. And we've got to understand that it's a voluntary organization and not everybody is available all the time. And some people might say, I'm available for an hour. Um, okay, get yourself there and at an hour, they disappear again because they might live reasonably close. In Suffolk, um, it's quite a large county, the furthest I've driven to a search while still in the county is an hour and 40 minutes. So you can understand that we're coming from all over the place, but it's a great thing because we're based all over the county. So it might be that it takes five minutes for one person to get there. It might take an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes for another person to get there. So I'm, I'm then looking at the responses coming back. I've set um, in that circle, I've sent out, I've told everybody where to go because I've looked at it. And generally we try to use supermarket, um, if we can, supermarket um, car parks, purely because we've got facilities there. Uh, we've got toilets, um, we've got food, we can get water, all that sort of thing. It may mean that we're in the middle, we're in an urban environment at that point. And quite often these big supermarkets are on the outskirts of a town or <clears throat> city which is great for us because what we've got is 24 by fours, or again, all their own vehicles, all um, volunteers, which will turn up and take people out to their search area. Um, so it might be that the search area is a wooded area in the middle of nowhere, six miles away from the nearest town, but we've still based ourselves at a reasonably close supermarket so that we've got facilities because we know that we could be there six, seven, eight hours. Um, each search member, needs to know that if they are deployed we would and it goes on we will they need to be there and have all the bits and pieces to be there for eight hours as a maximum then we would say look you need to go home although <clears throat> like all things there's many of us that have been there a lot longer than eight hours and kicked in the car for a couple of hours and then got up again right what, what what's next what's the next search area we're going to find this person um so everybody arrives um, and we, we would look at a reflex task, which is the first thing we would do. Um, that is 300 meters of the IPP. The IPP standing for initial planning point. That is the point either that they were last known, last seen. Um, that's where we physically know that they were. And it is surprising how many people are found just within that 300 meters. And it's quite a big sizable area, 300 meters in any direction. Of course, we wouldn't um, search if there's a big river or a railway track or a motorway in the way. There's no point in going the other side because they're not going to have crossed that. They'll have gone in different directions. So sometimes that's cut down. There's other natural um, obstacles, cliffs, you know, reservoirs, you know, marshes that may stop them. And that becomes a natural boundary. We would get to the marsh and go, OK, 
it's quite obvious that they haven't gone any further than this. So that may cut down, but the 300 meters is a reflex task and every search member knows that's exactly what the first task will be. It then comes down to the search planner to start going, right, this is what's happened. This is what we think's happened. This is where we're going to start to search. So that's where we start all the different assets and ops and everything is happening and going on. Quite often the police are just standing there going, what do you want us to do? Nothing, we'll, we'll give you a shout, go and do some policing. We may have the fire service with us. We've got helicopters we can call in if need be. Coast Guard, absolutely fantastic organization that help us out when we're near the coast. Because ultimately they look after the coast. So there you go, the RNLI, they have their inshore lifeboats um, and their offshore lifeboats that we've um, called upon to help and assist. Um, and we will put every asset that we possibly can at it that is valuable. We're not gonna throw an asset at it that isn't gonna be helpful just because just because we have it doesn't mean that we're going to use it. We then come to the point where we have to stand down. And I'm gonna do this first of all, where we've searched everything that is conceivable. When do we end a search? One of the most difficult things to, to do, when do we stop? Um, there was a airman that went missing, some of you may have heard of him, Corey McKee. We didn't stop searching for about six weeks. Um, as more information came in, we started going, well, let's search there now, let's search there now. On average, though, we would look to stand down the team after six to eight hours of sensible searching, depending on the environment, depending on the vulnerable missing person. And then we may reactivate the search the next morning. Quite often, it gets to the point where we can't search that because it is too dark. I mean, we will go into things that most people won't, but we need to search that wooded area again in daylight. It does depend on the missing person though, of course, and we will throw every asset we can. So we may return, but standing down a search without a find is very, very difficult. Most, and I would say 99% of the time, we find out that the missing person was never in those areas in the first place and had traveled by car, by coach, by bus, by taxi, hitchhiked somewhere else. Um, I was on a search, um, with the second day of a search in um, Suffolk a few years back, and they eventually came to us and said, nope, we found them. All right, where were they? Beachy Head. Went, what, that's 200 miles away. Yeah, they, they were picked up by the Samaritan station on Beachy Head, and we'd been searching all night, um, not a problem. And at no point do we ever get annoyed that we were searching for someone who wasn't there, because, we can categorically tell the police they are not there. And that's the two sides. It's nice to be able to find someone and return them and all that sort of thing, but we can say they're not there. And it's, you, you've got to think about it, you know, right, it cuts down the, the amount of areas that they've got, we've got searched when we say they're not there. And we call it rest of world, so ROW, when we've, you know, we may at some point go, right, we've exhausted everywhere. This is now a rest of world scenario. And 99% of the time, we are correct that it is rest of the world scenario. Sadly, yeah, of course, there, has, there is times where <clears throat> we haven't found a person um, and at a later date, they are found. And we've got to be realistic. And because they are in an absolutely obscure location that you know is in the middle of nowhere, or there are people that we've searched for that still haven't been found. Now, we don't know whether they are in Scotland, Saudi Arabia, in the, we, we know where we searched, they're not there. Um, we look at that we would always put two types of resources into any one area. So if we were to put a foot team through a wood, we would say, they would come back and say, yeah, probability of detection there, they might say 60, 70%, which is reasonably high. We might put a dog through there. We might put a search team, but send them in from a different angle so they get a different perspective on it all, to cover off as much as we possibly can. So we've got the highest percentage of probability of detection as possible. So the other side of the coin is when we do find someone and rescues. Um, dementia patients that we've found, um, I found two reasonably recent, recently. Uh, one um, was that um, we were coming along a track heading towards a different village um, where the person used to live and found the dementia patient facing a fence, just standing facing a fence, it was a big six, eight foot fence. Um, the footpath came along and it was 290 degrees. 
and they could not make the decision of where whether to turn left or right and literally just stand there facing down. I don't know how long they'd been there. Um, I would suspect a fair while. Walked up next to them and said, hi, how are you doing? Yeah, uh, I can't remember the exact conversation, but it was much along the lines, yes, I'm going here. Okay, how about I show you the way? Yeah, that'd be great, brilliant, thank you very much. Okay, yeah, well, it's this way. And just started a, a conversation, absolutely chatting to them while guiding them back to safety. Fantastic, yep, there we go. Um, that in that stage checked out by the medical team and um, yeah returned to loved ones and absolutely everything was fine. Another one that took us a bit longer recently um, was a dementia patient that was found sitting in a car, uh, not their car, and about three miles away from where they um, they lived and and we have absolutely no idea why they were in this other person's car, how they had got into this other person's car. They were particularly wet and the Wellingtons, the gentleman's Wellingtons were full of water all the way to the top. Um, so I don't know where he'd been and he was sitting in a car. They'd obviously tried the handle. It was open, got in, sat in there and just sat there. Um, we suspect from, you know, the steam on the inside of the car, the condensation and how wet the seat was that they had been there. He had been there cool, an hour, if not longer. Um, uh, I was called at that point and because on my medical side went in, did everything, um, got him sorted, warmed him back up again, and then returned him home. And yeah, fine, he was absolutely fine, which is um, a fantastic result. There are other sides of this coin though, um, where we've got people from a suicide point of view who have are attempting suicide, whether it's overdose um, or hanging themselves. We have a set of statistics um, about what an age group and a gender is likely to do. They're, more likely to hang themselves, they're more likely to jump off something, they're more likely to try and drown themselves, they're all very, very different. Um, and that affects our search plan, quite obviously. Um, and we have done rescues and I've done rescues where we've got to them in time before they've done the deed, or we haven't got to them in time, um, which is a crying shame. But when we haven't got to them in time, it does give closure to the family. Um, we, we've, we know that we have done our best to get to them in time. Um, and God forbid that, you know, the family never know what happened or never found them or that sort of thing. At least we can do that. We have a deceased victim reco recovery team, which can go in and with the greatest respect and dignity will cut someone down or remove them from the situation they're in to get them into the coroner's vehicle. Um, and it's a very sad moment. Um, for all of the team, you know, sometimes we kick ourselves to say, did we move quick enough? Did we search the right places first? But every time is a learning experience. Um, and <clears throat> we, we, we always learn. I learned um, a few months ago about a sighting, a suspected sighting that was f very uh, fleeting um, and we didn't pay too much attention to it and the police sort of dismissed it. And I deployed a search team to the, that site and um, I said, right, can you do 50 meters of the roundabout that this individual was apparently seen on, uh, paying particular attention to this footpath and go from there. Turns out they were found in a field 100 meters away from that sighting. Um, and we did, that team did find them, um, but we probably would have found them three or four hours earlier and they were fine and they needed a bit of medical attention, they were fine. And you sort of learn, okay, you know, as a search manager, when I look at it as a search planner, I go, right, that's a sighting. And now every single sighting, however much the police dismiss it, I deploy a search team to and do 100 metres of it just in case. Unless, of course, it's completely uh, random. I do have to have some thought process around it. So we do add out, you know, absolutely possibly everything we can to get these individuals back. And we learn and we take learnings from it. I'm a member of the committee and, and the search um, operations team, um, which meets um, every month to basically talk, debrief searches, take the learning from it. The committee, we run the organization. Um, and you know, it's, there's a lot to do when you're running a full charity, as probably a lot of you know. Um, everything from compliance and you know, all the bits, other bits and pieces. This at the moment, um, the COVID protocols that we have to work to, uh, from a first aid point of view and face-to-face -face training. How do we protect our members? How do we protect the public? God forbid that we would ever want the search team to give a missing person COVID. So how do we deal with this? What, what 
PPE do we need to put in place? What's the protocols around it? It's a lot, there's a lot more to be thought about. And we discussed this at length. And we're now thinking about what happens about vaccinations if we get the vaccinations, you know, how do we deal with the search team from that point of view? So there's all of that going on. It's, it's basically a full-time job that I do on top of my full-time job. And then the wife moans at me when I crawl in at four o'clock in the morning and wake the children up. She said, why can't you do this quietly? Or the phone goes off in the middle of the night and it wakes the whole house up and I've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old and yeah, I go running out of the house and I normally get a text message saying, thanks, um, as they're screaming their heads off, oh, daddy's on a rescue and all the rest of it. So that gives you a good idea, hopefully, about the what people go through, um, how they join, how they train, um, gives you an idea of how a search is put together, how we deploy a search team, what we're thinking about, um, and, and how it affects the individuals. It, I, mean, I didn't dwell on that too much. We did it, it does obviously affect um, the search teams and we have um, various uh, people, me being one of them, I'm a, one of my other little side things is I do training and one of those things I do mental health training. Um, and trim training, so trauma risk incident management. And I can talk to these guys and go, okay, how, how are you feeling after that? And, you know, I've had some long conversations with team members that have been reasonably upset by the fact of what happens if that was one of my parents that's wandered off? You know, is there a search team in, in round Salford, for argument's sake, that will come and help and the police will call? Will the police call them in time? Well, there's a million questions. Uh, and, and settling the fears. And it does take a special individual um, to, to go and do this um, um, because not so much when it goes completely right and it's all great, it's when, it, when you don't make a result, when you don't know where they are. It, is very, it can be very difficult because you're sitting there in night and at night going, did I search that properly? Did, um, I know every single member of the search team has at some point gone back to a search area the following day or the following week just to check because that's the diligence that these people have. It's a fantastic thing, but it's a lot of commitment as well. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an overview. Let's, let's reopen the question a bit and see what happens. This is where I'm gonna get a barrage. How long does it take to train a search dog? So that is obviously depending, the two types of dog, I, was, I think I explained them both, but uh, the area search dog, which will find anybody in a uh, open area and come back and tell you, or the trailing dog, which will take a specific scent and follow that scent to that person. The dog lead will not want me to hear, hear me say this, but it's generally 18 months to your first type of thing and then three years till you're fully operational for a search dog. How many dogs have you got in the team? So you talked about 78 volunteers. Does that include your dogs? No, each person is a, their secondary trade is a dog handler. Uh, we've got one trailing dog, nationally recognised trailing dog, um, and no area dogs at the moment, but seven in training. At this point, I'm imagining that Harris is like just really ashamed, you know, like he's in his bed now going, oh, I'm sorry, Dad, I should have been there for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, uh, we could ask him, but he's fallen asleep. So. <laughs> I, I, I was interested uh, in everything that you've said. Casualty Union, didn't know about a Casualty Union, that just sounds amazing. Yeah, really, really good. <laughs> how, how much does it cost to run your charity? Yeah, because you're all just doing this as volunteers, like you said, you're working full time and this is another full time role. How, how much does it cost for your organisation, your charity every year? Yeah, so to give you a, a rough breakdown, um, it costs about £3,000 in insurance. Um, that's the vehicles, the individuals, everything in short. Um, that's about what we got paid for insurance year. Roughly uh, rent, uh, rates, um, electricity for our building, which we've only had just over a year. We, we got, uh, luckily, a, a company said, oh, you find the land, we'll build it for you. Fantastic. Um, that costs around six to ten thousand pounds a year to run that building. Um, with you've got the land rent and all that sort of thing, which is all very much discounted, um, which is great. Uh, electricity companies don't seem to discount anything we've noticed. Um, um, and then on top of that, you've got all the other bits and pieces. We generally say that it costs around fifteen thousand pounds a year to run the organisation. 
I mean, that's pretty cheap, isn't it? Because that's a lot of time. So if you, if you, yeah, for the, all the time that you all put in, that goes up into the hundreds of thousands. If you were to run it as a organisation, that a commercial organisation, I mean, just paying 70, 70 odd members to be there by the hour, um, the vehicles, everything, you'd be, yeah, well over two hundred thousand pounds a year. Yeah, and beyond. You mentioned three words, and I don't know what three words means. You were talking about the police, and I was like, I don't know what that means. What, what three words? Three Sounds words, like yeah. So what it is, is every square metre across the whole of the planet has been assigned three words. Right. <laughs> and you can type in those three words, so you, you would use the word dot, the word dot, and the word, and it will take you to a square metre somewhere on the planet. Obviously, you can't just make them up because it's got to be a sign. And if you were to type in what three, as in the number three words, into Google, you could find exactly where you are now as what three words. What? That's amazing. I didn't know that either. Oh, my Lord, I'm getting in so much yeah. information here. Every day's a school day. <laughs> it really is. It really is. But Joy, you were part all of All right, Bev. Bev's saying there's an app, Emma. All right, I didn't know, did I? You know, Bev's all over it. She's like, God, Emma, why are you not on that app? Uh, Joy, it brought back some uh, memories of from when you were in um, Essex Search and Rescue. Fantastic, yeah. We should say that um, thank you to Joy for setting up this talk today. So because Joy was a volunteer in Essex Search and Rescue, she had contacted Harold, um, Search Manager, am I right? Was he Search Manager, Ron? Who well, yeah. had, um, wasn't wasn't in that role anymore, but connected us up with Dave over in Suffolk. So that's how we we ended up with the talk today. So thank you, Joy, for doing that. Really appreciate it. Um, Bev's just said she's an outdoor buff. That's why she knows the. <laughs> I'm an outdoor buff. That's why she knows that. Right. So any more questions? We've got a few more minutes left. So any more questions? Send them over our way. Um, I'm just going to open up the um, polls just so you can let us know if you've had a good time today if you found the talk interesting so that's just opened up now what if no one's available dave what if like the call goes out and literally 78 77 people not available i can't see it ever happening i would tell my boss i'm going fire me i'm going to save someone's life yeah you can imagine the blues paper when they yeah i was fired for going to save someone's life <laughs> Uh, no, I said it's a little extreme. We've never come up against that scenario. I did. I have had a search where only ten people are available before, but you use the assets you've got. Yeah. What What I really liked when you were talking about, um, I don't know if it was a man or a woman, the person living with dementia who was going back to his old village, and had got to that that point. Should I go left? Should I go right? And I just loved how you just. You just started a conversation. There was no panic there. It was just a conversation. It was like, no, okay, I know it's it's off to the left here. Come on. And you just you just guided them in a really calm way. And that that did feel really lovely how you described that. Yeah. And that's what we we tried to train the guys that there is no panic. There isn't anything like that. Certainly with dementia patients, it's just a conversation. You're right, how are you doing? And generally, sometimes you do come across them that quite often are scared and worried and it's but it's got to be calming um, we do not wear um yellow high vis on the grounds that we don't want to look like a police officer we sometimes wear orange vis but certainly with dementia patients if we think we've made a phone that comes off and we're in red and black wow. um, for that sort of side of things and yeah. we all wear helmets so quite often the helmet comes off it's tried to look as approachable as possible how many people are you searching like so say last year 2020 how, how many how many searches were there last year for suffolk 63 deployments right in the last week we've had five well okay because <laughs> you were sort of over like one one a week sort of last year and then but obviously they come in peaks and troughs it's not all oh, absolutely yeah and although before christmas we hadn't been deployed for six weeks right yeah because yeah. and I'll... and but that's unusual because we would suspect that normally to be silly season sorry excuse the pun but that's quite often what happens is um you know we have to be reasonably jovial about it but we call it silly season because right there's a lot going to happen so everybody's primed already and there was nothing um, it is what it is. 
and I wonder how COVID had um, impacted on that. So were pe less, you know, people were out less, pe you know, did that, does that have an impact? Are people moving around less? Uh, yes, they are, um, which actually makes our job slightly easier, certainly from the urban search, because if we find, if we see anybody, is that a missing person rather than lots of people? Um, but um, yeah, people are moving around less, but then it's starting to take a toll now on the mental health side. We thought it was going to be earlier, but it is much more now that um, that it's it's becoming too much for individuals. And, and Bev has put a, comment, a question at the bottom. Have you seen an increase in searching for people with mental health and suicidal tendencies since the COVID pandemic lockdowns, which is what you were just saying then? We are now. Uh, yeah, we absolutely are now. In my daytime role, um, as head of safeguarding. Um, so my, I get reports through safeguarding, he mental health and health and safety through every day. And I've been spotting the trend, a massive increase um, in um, ill mental health concerns due to the pandemic. Absolutely. And that's something that well, we've never, I suppose that's something we've never seen before, is it like, yes, people are more suicidal, but the fact, you know, the trigger for that, the pandemic, the lockdown, you know, in our living memory, none of us have been through that, seen that. So it's hard to use statistics to, to track those. Yeah, absolutely. The biggest concern that we had, which we haven't seen yet, thankfully, is we quite often get a call where a carer will go into a patient's house or a couple's house with both with dementia. Um, and the carer goes in in the morning and then comes back in the afternoon and one of them isn't there. And the other goes, oh, I don't know where they are. And that's when we have, that's when we get deployed. Um, to give you uh, an example of that, which bless her, and we, we did find her, it was fantastic. A lady and, well, husband and wife went to the hospital. Husband had a routine x-ray of some description. And you go in the x-ray bit and you go in that door, you sit there and you go out the other door when you've had your x-ray. Well, he, uh, she, sorry, she was having the x-ray. Yes. It matters not who was. Anyway, they forgot that they were both at the x-ray because one went out the other door and sat there. The lady, she would lived in a town that started with W Westerfield, was getting the bus home. She got on the bus to Whitton, which is another village, slightly different. What she did was she traced exactly the same walk that she would have made after getting off the bus in Westerfield, but did it in Whitton. 10.30 that night, we found her in the middle of a sugar beet field. She'd taken her dentures out, folded up all her clothes, put them down in a, in a sort of slip, and had gone to sleep. The only reason we found her, well, because we found her so quickly, is because she stood up to go to the toilet. It scared the life out of our search team because all they saw was this white thing appear in the, <laughs> with lit up the torch. And Bless her, she was okay, she was absolutely fine. It was a summer search, um, and you know, but it was all down to, she thought she got off the right place and she thought she was, which well, must have thought she was home and she went, well, it's bedtime, we'll go to bed then. Um, so there's bits and pieces like that, which um, it's, um, it's all interesting stuff. And that's we've seen many over the years, as you can imagine. The, I feel like everyone's just gone, let's get a comment in, let's get a question in, right? Um, so Jen, Jen, Jen's asked, Jen and Paul have said, have you seen an increase in searching for people with dementia? Um, no, I think we've seen, I've seen a constant stream. I wouldn't say I've seen an in, increase. Um, I, I would say that over the last six months of last year, we didn't search for a dementia, no, two dementia patients. We saw a decrease at that point. So whether... I don't know. Uh, that must have something to do with the pandemic. The pandemic, some way. I don't. I don't know. But uh, I would say it saw a decrease last year. So people just not going outdoors locked. Bev, Bev's asked, "Is it is it right when people are hypothermic they tend to undress outdoor?" Bev, this is outdoor. Bev asking the question. Uh, not that I'm aware of. No. Um, the generally they stand in a ridiculous. Uh, um, pose which is like you'll all see it they go hand try to keep their clothes off their body all that actually does is increase their surface area so they cool down quicker um but no i've, I've not seen that um that i'm aware of when people have, they take their clothes off although as soon as we go into a first aid situation the first thing we generally do is take their clothes off because that's not we need to warm them up we don't want to warm their clothes up that's pointless warm them up um, you'll have heard of the bits and pieces, the mountaineering thing, strip off naked and get in the sleeping bag with them. There's a lot of truth in that. 
with that image in my head, Debbie has said, will we be sharing the recording? Yes, Debbie, it'll go on YouTube. Um, so I'll include the link. You'll get an email out tomorrow. I'll include the link on there. And there's one more question from Debbie, which said, Dave, do you see a difference between summer and winter or day and night in the frequency or type of call out? Sorry if this has already been answered. Um, yeah, uh, generally our calls come in at around between six and nine o'clock in the evening. Uh, during a weekday and the most common time after that is 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. No idea well. We jokingly say when the police go to bed they call us um, no. uh, and if the weather's bad we never go yeah we're gonna get called out. <laughs> <laughs> um, Joy, Joy put a comment on there and I don't know if this is a technical term. I remember seeing a MISPA on the way to an RSV. She's using technical jargon here. So MISPA yeah. is what we call missing person. Uh, and um, RSV is not what I'm aware of, but I think you should probably meaning RVP, which is rendezvous point, which is where we would beat the team, which would be the Tesco's or or similar. So she's she's found someone missing on the way to the rendezvous point by the sounds of that. Yeah, and the highest mountain in my old job. <laughs> Paul, you're <laughs> such a geek. I can't believe you're asking the question. I've done Kilimanjaro twice. Uh, and then there was a mountain pass up, up in the Himalayas at 6,200 metres. Brilliant. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close the chat and the Q&A now because that came rapid in the last few minutes. I feel like I need to go and calm down. Joy, don't worry. She says, sorry, I've got dementia. We know, <laughs> we know Joy. And thank Joy, once again, thank you for setting this up. It's been like truly, truly one of the most interesting talks. All the talks are good, but this has been really interesting and just the amount of new information. And like when you started it by saying, no one's ever heard of us, I was sat there thinking, no, I've never heard of you. I'm so sorry, I felt bad that I'd never heard of you. Um, thank you so much for your time, Dave. Really, really appreciate it. Um, thank you for sharing all your story. Oh, there you go. Dave shared his email if people want to contact him about mountains that he's climbed <laughs> or to volunteer. If they're moving to Suffolk. Um, next week, we have a talk from uh, Jackie Cannon, who um, leads the Louis Body Society. And so she's going to be giving us a talk um, same time next week. Thank you, everybody, for coming along and for being so uh, enthusiastic with your questions and your comments. <laughs> Dave, thank you once again. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say goodbye now and turn off. And yeah, just thank everyone and, and say take care to everyone. Just that.